You thought you'd kill us off. I tried. We're back. I'm mad as hell. You want to have a great shootout of 2010? Yeah. Fine. Let's do it. Five paces. One, two, three, four, five. Remember that, Phil? Blimey, it's, it's <laughs> fun with those. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, that was fun. I enjoyed that. Okay, so today we're talking about the anniversary, the 10th anniversary of the 5D camera. 5D and, Mark II. Well, is it, was it the Mark II or is the original on the 5D? Ooh. Ooh. It was the two. That and was the big more, one. And it's more than 10 years as well. Oh, wow. I want to like have us each kind of recall a story before we get started. And the story that I'm going to recall, I'll start and then you can go and then Phil can go, is there was a time when you had your Nikon camera and it was a, a stills camera. And we were standing in that room over there and we opened up the back and we were saying, why can't they just like have a digital sensor here? And then we would have all the opticalness of a 35 millimeter camera. And then uh, when we got the first early version of the 5D, I was thinking, oh my God, this is gonna be amazing. The only thing I cared about was having an optical focus because I'm so sick of video focus. And I'm like, oh, this is gonna be so exciting when we got this. And we realized quickly that when you go into the video mode, you only got the screen on the back. So you and I were standing there and all of a sudden mm -hmm. I thought, I thought of my Hasselblad camera mm -hmm. uh, magnifier hood. I ran over into the case, dug it up, stuck it on the back and it exactly was the perfect size and everything. And that is kind of where the Z finder was born, but it was the only way to really use that camera. Yeah, like a, like a video camera. Yeah. In other words, yeah, the Nikon that was out just before, its video quality wasn't there, so it's like we weren't really even paying attention to it until this one came out, and it was like, wow. And then all the feedback from other filmmakers saying how great the image was, all of a sudden, this was a real filmmaking tool, just in a screwy form factor. Well, people should know that when Canon came out with the camera, I had many friends at Canon, and it was originally came out as a stringer camera. In other words, for mm -hmm. like news guys, where they figured, well, if they're out there getting images, why can't they just get a little video and then they could use this and they wouldn't, then all of a sudden they figured, whoa, the, uh, you know, we, we took that thing, we saw it and we were like, this has cinema capabilities here. Mm -hmm. Phil, what is your first, well, I'm gonna, I ask you what your first recollection is and then I'm gonna remind you, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I know my first recollection and whether it's the same as yours. So. I had a Nikon D90 and I didn't like it. And I saw Vincent Lafaray's, oh, just hit my uh, reverie, which was great. But I wasn't interested in camera because it was only 30p and there was no manual controls. So I was like, forget that. And it was in, when I went to NAB in 2009, <laughs> in April, you loaned me a 5D and, oops, the original Z finder, which is, we'll try and get it in focus. Pull that Come back on, towards your face. Well, but he's got good autofocus. Go. It'll do it, it'll oh, do it, there right. we go. And so I took it to Hawaii, and I had a gig in Hawaii, and I'd been hiking and using the big 35 mil adapter and tripod, and it was exhausting, but I was shooting 30p. So I, I said to the client, let me try this camera tomorrow, just to see how it goes. And that was really the turning point. Let's show some images from that Hawaii video and we can talk underneath it. Uh, but there, you left a little part of that story out from NAB that I had to beg you to take that camera. I kept saying, at that NAB, everybody thought we were idiots. They all said, this is stupid. They were laughing at us. They were laughing yeah. at us with our rigs and all this kind of shit. And I said, Phil, please take, you were going to Hawaii like the next day. And I'm like, please, look at his face. <laughs> I'm like, please take this camera. And you're like, you laughed at me too. It was only because I, I just didn't think it was for me. 
really. And you know, obviously, I was in, I was clearly wrong. Uh, you know, I got past the manual control issue, and it helped a lot using non-Canon lenses, um, using um, Nikon adapted size lenses with manual control, which helped so much. And suddenly, it, it was a viable camera because it was actually sitting in the apartment in Hawaii for a long time, a good week before I even picked it up because I had also at the same time the Panasonic GH1 which had just come out which had which shot 24p, 25p, full manual control but obviously with a micro four third sensor so I started using that as well playing around but once I used the 5D and I saw you know this this background I have right now on my shot is a nice homage to super shallow depth of field that was the thing that uh, everything was shot in well, that's what that's what the whole scenario was. Is yes. the shallow depth of field made us all feel finally like we had a motion picture camera. We should back up a little bit. I mean, uh, the industry was what it was, pretty level. We were all dealing with depth of field adapters, which were huge rigs at the time and a pain in the butt to make look good. Uh, although you got the 24p in that shallow depth of field. That's why this camera, I think, exploded, is because it gave you all that in a small form factor, and it was gorgeous. You know, you didn't need all this spinning right. ground glass uh, mechanism anymore in a, right. a two-foot-long rig. Um, so, I mean, that, along with its really low light capability, I mean, those two things alone, I think, made this thing go through the roof. Right, but we should give Brian Valente a shout-out for really figuring out for how to take a video camera and make it look like a motion picture Don't camera. Don't we have that shot? I don't think so, oh. <laughs> but uh, you know that was the start of it. I think it's fair to say that this camera literally changed. I'm going to say our lives for sure, mm -hmm. completely. What about yours? I don't yours? know about you, Phil. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I, I think it changed the industry. Completely changed the industry. It, it from from this point onwards, everybody wanted large sensors, and so manufacturers then started to you know, think about we need to make large sensor video cameras. I mean, just, that's a step forward, but it really was the turning points because there was no video camera that had a sensor as big as that at the time. And it took a long time before there was. It was unique. So even guys who were shooting Super 35 fell in love with it because it was full frame and they were able to shoot that for video. So it was just enormous the impact cannot be underestimated and then uh what it did for our industry meaning the manufacturing part there was only a handful of guys that made yeah. accessories at the time here look there's a picture of garrett brown there right um some of these pictures are kind of interesting where when we were showing it people were like okay come on this can't be for real but you know there's gary adcock i mean we really i mean starting with that first shootout that we did phil um, we introduced this camera to the ASC members, to people at NAB, and they were looking at it kind of like, yeah, it looks interesting, but can I really use like a 35 millimeter camera to be a filmmaker? And that, you know, things happened after that to where we added some of the creature comforts that people actually needed. Here's a shot from that shootout. Um, well, that's kind of what I was getting at, too, is that uh, all of a sudden there was an explosion of accessory makers because that camera needed help to be able to use it professionally. And right. so our whole industry changed in that respect, too. Right. You know, a lot more competition came out. There was a lot of rig choices. Um, but uh, I like to say we led the way with that, as you can see in some of these pictures. Yeah, Phil, here's Phil. I thought you said you didn't that's, use it. That's <laughs> that's, that's Red Tails. That, is, that, that was on Red Tails, that shot. Yeah. But that was very minimal stuff. To be fair, I just I've always liked to keep my rigs as relatively light as possible. Only have essentials like this photo like here, like this, like a map box got, and a file only, of focus. Only, yeah, but the reason why I, that was a posed photo for the cover of the Learn 5D Cinematography DVD. So normally that all comes off. So okay, it was just like this is what people put on. First off, too, they thought the toys were really cool, but also because clients would, you know, you turn up with this camera yeah. and they're like, no. But if you'd stuck on a map box and, you know, big rigs, they were suddenly happy. Right. So that was one of the biggest issues we had as well. That whilst the camera worked great, a lot of people weren't accepting of it who didn't know about it. 
Well, then we got into that whole points of contact nonsense where it wasn't nonsense, actually, it was a big deal where how you could stabilize this camera by having your eye, your shoulder and your hand, each one of these, you know, and then it evolved to things like this where we had actual viewfinders. Uh, because remember you had that funky offset thing where people mm -hmm. were using it like this with monitors and it's, you know, it, it is hard to put this thing, you know, into a, you can use it in that sort of gorilla mode, but getting it on your shoulder, which is what, you know, a lot of us want to do was difficult. And we had all these different iterations of things we went through to get it on your shoulder and, um, the, the interesting thing is, is we've kind of, we evolved into the bigger cameras and it seems like now we're evolving back into the smaller cameras. What do you With think? With the mirrorless though? cameras, yeah. I, well, I never, to be fair, I never left. I mean, I- Oh, bullshit, I cameras, saw but... you using FS7s <laughs> and C300s. No, I, no, 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 no. I still, look, I, I uh, so I bought the AF101, the F3, the red, um, which, what was the red, was it? It was the red Epic, and then a C300, and et cetera, et cetera. So I bought all the video cameras, but I never stopped using DSLRs and then mirrorless. I've always liked the small form factor. So for bigger jobs, obviously the video cameras, but they were, the stills cameras were always part of it. It was a big part of Wonderlist five years ago, and it's been a big, still a big part of all my work. So it's never gone away, and I've always loved having a small camera. And that's you know, using something like uh, this camera I'm on right now, which is the Sony A7R. Or it works great just like that. Obviously, if you add things in, it can help. But we have an EVF and stuff. And I'm a big, you know, the technology that we have in these cameras, and this is what's happened. Star, you know, it started with the 5D. The technology we had in this eventually got through to video cameras, and the technology that we have in the mirrorless cameras are going through to the video cameras, like things like autofocus and of course full frame. So it's, you know, it's, it's been, I've, I've always loved having them both. And I still prefer shooting on smaller cameras because it, you can be so much quicker. And, you know, I, I love shooting on the tripod and it's lighter. Running around grabbing the shots, it's really nice. And I shoot handheld when I need to. But for me, they've never gone away. Look, look at and that image. They, I'm sorry, yeah. Phil. So, There's a Robert Rodriguez. That's more, that's, yeah. Robert uh, Rodriguez, he's... He's obviously using it as a second camera, but look at this. That is a 5D within that big rig that his operator is using. Well, they were probably and... shooting a real motion picture, you know. Actually, yeah. what were they yeah, shooting? I remember. Um, a music video, perhaps? No, no, no. It was an actual movie because I sent him all that stuff. Right. And I, I don't remember what it is now, but I, I think he's I think actually probably maybe video. using that as a director's finder. What? I think this was a music video that he shot. Like, I remember oh, it was? when he did this. All right, I Sorry. want to show Vincent's video, a little clip from that, because that did sort of, um, we had all of, I don't know if you had it, but we had the camera prior to that, and then Vincent came out with that video like days after mm -hmm. that, and then the whole world just was like, oh my God, this thing is really cool. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at Vincent's video. The coolest thing about this camera is that any still photographer or amateur can just pick it up out of the box and just start to shoot films. When the prototypes of the 5D Mark II came into the Canon offices, I saw this camera, saw what it could do, and I just knew I wanted to try something with it. Little did I know that we kind of put together this little a short film uh, called Reverie. You know, we were doing storyboarding between midnight and 2 a.m. Uh, the day of the shoot, and at 4 p.m. we set action for the first time. We shot it over two nights on a relatively small budget and uh, cut it in four hours. My experience level with this, I had no manual, I literally hit record. Uh, we're not talking complicated here, and just about anyone can pick this thing up, uh, buy a few nice lenses, and be producing some pretty amazing quality footage. Yeah, that was yeah. pretty cool. That changed a lot. Yeah, yeah, it was an interesting uh, video. I remember when that came out, boy, that thing got some views, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So, but wait, I want kind of wanted to get back to, to Phil. So before that camera came out, what was your career like? And then, then you kind of really used that to kind of go in a different direction, didn't you? And, and tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, well, I left news after 17 years and that was like 2006. And so after that, I was always, I was trying to, you know, gets a, a different unique look and then a, I came across depth of field adapters and took those on in a big way 
and then so that's when I started my blog. And then when the started using the five D in April May two thousand nine, definitely it changed things because I I did a I put out a video which was called Sophia's People, which is me just walking around with the Canon five D Mark II, the fifty mm Zeiss planar, and Jules F Finder, just getting video portraits of people in there and it that that went huge as well and that's so i started getting lots of work from that and a lot of interest and the whole sort of everything came from that the workshops came from that everything mm -hmm. did so yeah, it, was, it, uh, was, yeah. it, it did it definitely i don't know where my career would have gone without it it certainly, it certainly went in a, in a a fascinating way and i've always loved new technology and you know if anything that comes out i'll embrace it but the 5D, it's the 5D Mark II. It was very, very special camera, and it's and it, you know it was flawed. Um, we're not just talking about the the way it is the actual operation of it. The image wasn't great. It had imperfections, and it wasn't particularly detailed and sharp. But that's kind of part of what we liked about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the 5D Mark III came out, and it technically technically was better, but the image seemed to lack something special. That the 5D Mark II had, so it's it's interesting kind of that sort of everybody gravitated to Canon at the time, and then they slowly trickled away when the the the, the 5D cameras. The next I I didn't even get the 5D Mark IV because it's you know the 4K was so cropped you lost that whole full frame ability, which is the reason why you use these cameras in the first place. And so yeah. lots of people moved to the video cameras. But lots of people also moved to the Panasonics and the GH4, and of course the Sony mirrorless cameras. So it's kind of it's 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 a weird thing because Canon had something magic, and they didn't really hang on to it. They let a lot of that market drift away when they should have. I feel they should have carried on developing their their DSLRs for video. Um, they, I think they missed the trick there because they are well, amazing. I don't think they actually you know, realized, like, like I was saying before, that this thing was going to be a cinema tool. But, um, you know, these things happen in ebbs and flows. Like in the 70s, you know, uh, JVC was rocking. In the 80s, Hitachi and JVC, 90s, Betacams and Sonys. You know, Panasonic started killing it in the early 2000s. <clears throat> these things, you know, the, the camera, you, somebody's always on top and then because they come out with an innovation. But Phil, you you started making these videos with the 5D, and people were really I don't want to you know pat you on the back too much because you'll get a little too excited here. <laughs> but people were anticipating these videos. Like you came out with the one in Europe, and and then you came out with the one with the boat, you know, Dungeness. Dungeness. And then I want to play this cherry blossom one because you came to Chicago and we made one at the art fair, and it talks about this portrait mode that you were. Doing and you had this really unique style of just kind of looking at people, like looking into their soul, kind of. Let's roll that clip. So this is at the Old Town Art Fair, and yeah. it, this was so it was the same. It was a, uh, the same thing that I was doing with the people. That? That's my daughter there, there. <laughs> a decade ago. Oh, Viesha and John. Why do I feel like I'm watching a whole movie? All I know of a it's it's amazing, <laughs> but I mean, look at these images. I mean, even to today's camera, this is totally fine. Mm -hmm. You could use that camera right now. I would rather not. I can do. <laughs> I've got better now. I mean, it's 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 not just. I mean, the image had this nice look about it. You know, we talked about 35 mil adapters. Whilst they were pain in the ass. They had a certain look, which was also very attractive. And I, I guess we're kind of looking for these sort of things when we're actually shooting. We're looking for something interesting. But these days, we we want our cameras to actually be easy to use. And we want lots of detail. And we want lots of dynamic range. We want different things. Back in the 5D Mark II days, we weren't thinking about dynamic range and resolution so much. We were just loving the aesthetic of the image. Which I still think is something you should go for, is the look more than all the numbers. Right. But wait, let me get back to how this camera was a disruptor and really changed things, because that's kind of what we're really talking about. 
Um, Phil, when when that camera came out, it, you had an audience, right? But I think mm -hmm. your audience boomed because there was a lot of still photographers that decided to come over. And there's a lot more of those guys in the industry than there are of our guys, if you want to call it that, that wanted to get into video for all their event use and all that. So all of a sudden, your audience was bigger. Our customer base grew. Yeah, we called it convergence. It, yeah, convergence. That was a big disrupting experience right. that that camera caused. So that, again, is another reason why that camera should hold a place in history. <laughs> but the bigger issue to me is that when we did the first shootout, which wasn't long after, you know, and there were a bunch of us, Mick and Den and you, and we were all, you know, you know, sort of leading this charge to this, this new technology. When we did that first shootout, film was still king. Mm -hmm. You know, and we said, can these cameras, wasn't the whole point of the shootout was, can these cameras compare yes. against film right and people i mean that you know we had zillions of views and people were like wow it's it even a tipping point there and then people in hollywood were not liking us yeah saying they that. were not liking <laughs> us saying that literally and yeah. but some of them watched it and were you know in each of the consecutive shootouts people were like i mean th the industry changed mm -hmm. there is a total change from you know 85 90 percent of or even more film to now starting to work on what we're going to call video. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, oh, wait, Mandy's I'm, got some comments. Speaking of the, the shootout here, I'm uh, Nick Driftwood is actually commenting that he says the GH2 pack plus the hack changed everything. We never had high bit rate um, and that the 2012 uh, Zakuto shootout was a legendary moment for that. Um, mm, right, he's right. Yeah, what was this hack again? It it, so basically it changed technically it changed things it gave us more professional um recording higher bit rates and stuff that we weren't getting it was remember the 5d mark ii was very compressed mm -hmm. it didn't change the aesthetic because it was micro four thirds but it you know when nick driftwood made the driftwood hack we, and it was just firmware and, and you know it, the great thing about that hack is that panasonic saw what it was doing and took it on board for the GH3, and I did the I did the launch video for the GH3, which was the one in called Genesis. Whereas Canon, you know, we have Magic Lantern, and we still have Magic Lantern, but Canon never took that on board because they showed what the camera was capable of, but they didn't embrace it, which is what they should have done, like Panasonic, which was a real shame. Mm. Let's show another clip from the one from the shootout which was, again, shortly after these, you know, other people jumped into the game, you know, with the GH5. Uh, Nikon had one previous in the 5D. Let's see that clip and we can kind of talk about it a little bit. I would have never expected that a digital still camera would have performed that way. Also, that transition from film to video was nowhere near the shocking ledge it used to be. You know, that no, yeah, no, no. we should be incredibly excited that we are actually in the middle of this revolution re this revolution this revolution, this revolution, this revolution yeah i mean i've i've obviously well, shot now extensively with each of them and uh, you know I'm, they know it's interesting to me that the 5d still feels like the king it's nice to see these cameras in contrast because you can see how far they've come this looks pretty damn good yeah it's, i mean it's, it's really remarkable did you think that it would have that type of latitude against the film or less latitude or more I expected it to look good. I didn't expect it to look this good. It was impressive. Yeah. Like 5D have, looks like film. What does that mean for film? Well, I mean, it's over. <laughs> we are not talking about video anymore. We are talking about film, a digital film. This is the first yes. time that really there are no boundaries between video and film. Oh my God, it was so nice to see Carlos in there. I haven't talked mm -hmm. to him in so long. Uh, Shane made a comment in there. Um, His comment was, "It's over." <laughs> yeah, that that's a little shocking in 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 2010. Yeah, um, film did die off a little quicker than I thought because of all this, but I mean, it's still around. Well, I'll tell you what what struck me is that we the first screening where film was sitting on the couch there was at Film Workers Club, which was a film lab mm -hmm. and the last post house that was in Chicago. Right. And it's closed, up, I think, last year. Yeah. So it's that, I mean, my God, the, we don't even have a film lab anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's shocking. So uh, what do you remember from the shootout, Phil, that was like the most turning moment that, that really you were like, holy shit. 
I have no recollections of it at all. <laughs> and looking at that now, I'm like, oh, I remember that. <laughs> oh my god, it was a, it was so long ago. It wasn't that long ago, but it feels like a really long time ago. Well, that's a decade. Those shootouts were they were incredibly hard work for you guys, and it was just. Yeah, and, and of course, the problem is you are. It's a thankless task being a shootout because people are going to just bitch and whine and complain, saying, "Ah, oh, this and this and this isn't fair and stuff." And also, it was a. It wasn't looking at the aesthetics. It was all about technicality as well. Um, so they had to keep it fair when and was even. The, when, but when it was, was controversial the last time too. Did a shoot? Yeah, when was the last time you did one? It must be a good eight, nine. No, you did one more recently than I did. Yeah, you? we did a, a head-to-head, -head and we were supposed to be doing one now, although I just don't want to do it. I don't know I'm supposed to do it, but I don't want to do it. The problem is the cameras are changing so fast. By the time you get it out there, there's already new cameras that people are like, why didn't you have that in there? So it's almost too hard to keep up. It, it is. And, uh, okay, I know Mandy has a few comments just from what people are saying. What kind of comments do you have, Mandy? Yeah, we just have George that says, I remember when I went to film school in the early 90s, it was a sin to say the V word video. Nobody in their right mind would have thought it was surpassed film. Um, and then we have some other comments. Um, he also said that he um, felt like the 5D Mark II things got much easier, but the image on the 5D was more digital than the organic look you had with the depth of field adapters and old lenses. Well, I mean, the depth of field adapter, I got to admit, there was something cool about it. It gave you that kind of grain structure mm -hmm. that that was sort of filmish, you know. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, I mean, it was, it, at the time it was lovely because before that, I wasn't able to get any shadow depth of field unless you had, you know, you went really far away from your subjects and zoomed right in. Uh, it was a nightmare. <laughs> I recently went back and had a look at some of the footage. And it's like uh, it's like looking back at old video games, and mm -hmm. they're like, mm, it's not as good as I remember. It's like, oh yeah, I, I see the huge imperfections because obviously I'm now very used to 4K and seeing everything, and it and it looks, you know, that sort of thing looks wonderful. And then going back, it it's better than standard definition by far, but it it certainly looks it, it's it's stated badly. Interestingly, though, I've just been sent one for my iPhone from Beast Grip, a depth of field adapter. <laughs> really? So I'm going to give that a try for nostalgia value, um, which is crazy. But you know that it, these things are fun. It's it's you know a nice little trip down memory lane. Yeah, I'm going to wrap this up with you know we can each have a final comment. It's funny that you say iPhone because. Ah, oh, God, I hate to say this, but lately I am kind of shooting almost everything that's because we're doing mostly social media. I'm not doing a documentary right now. I wish I was, but um, I use my damn iPhone, man. This Filmic Pro and the iPhone, I can do all these adjustments. People come in the comments and they're like, wow, what camera do you use? I'm like, iPhone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it boiled down to what we, we said in 2012, which is really... These are just tools, talent, creativity, and that's why we kind of stopped doing shootouts because at a certain point, the cameras, really we stopped in 2012, which is still wasn't far off from the 2010 shootout because the, the conclusion was anybody could make any camera look amazing. So it's really not the camera, it's you, man. There is no magic bullet, there's no magic pill. I think you actually said that in, in Light and Shadow, Phil. That was your line, you said, <clears throat> you know. It's, I remember what you said, you go, I watch films, uh, I learn by watching. So all I can say to people is, you wanna use your iPhone, fine. You wanna use uh, the 5D, fine. None of these things are going to make you a great filmmaker. What's going to make you a great filmmaker is your vision and how you execute your create your creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you said pretty much everything, but um, it's this camera that I think really affected and have has created by evolution all the cameras that we are enjoying and loving today. I mean, without that camera, I don't know, it might have been a very different path. You know what I mean? Totally, Bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it would have. I don't know. It would have got there eventually, but uh, it would have taken a lot longer. Mm. It's. It was so disruptive. 
and Canon weren't expecting it. They, as, as we talked about earlier, that it wasn't planned. And, the, and Canon stills and video were very separate divisions and it kind of shocked the Canon video division. And so, you know, it, it, everybody by surprise and everybody was playing catch up and it completely changed everything. And now, yeah, you talk about the iPhones are great, but we can buy, you can buy a full frame camera with that shoots 4K now for about fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars and it just shows you how affordable these things were because they were still about three thousand dollars back then weren't they the 5d mark ii yeah but yeah i mean it's it's um i'd actually quite i did because i pulled it out in, in anticipation for this uh i want to use it again but there's something happened very recently that made me want to put it out is i got an email from canon professional services saying the 5d mark ii is no longer supported which means it is officially obsolete as of December last year, hmm. which has made me very sad. So you can't get parts for it. If it goes wrong, there'll be no more parts for it. I would love to see you do a retrospective video where you, you use all the skill and talent that you have in you, which is tons, and go back to that camera and show the world that it's not about the camera. It's literally about you. And we always had this line that, you know, the best camera is the one that you have with you at that time. And I always have my iPhone with me. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, unless I have a camera bag, that's the best camera I have. And I'm going to do what I can to make that thing look amazing. Mm -hmm. And to pick I've the right tool my for FX the project. Nine on me. What was that? <laughs> I always have my Sony FX9 on me, whether I go to the supermarket or anything. Go, no, <laughs> yeah, I've right. always got my my FX9. No, I, I actually always take a proper stills camera with me wherever I go. Yeah, well, you were um, always but, doing that. I mean, you were a photographer. I mean, I, I, but now, I, well, I'm not going to say it, but I, my iPhone, man, I can get some pretty, everybody's a professional photographer now. You look at these pictures people take, and I used to struggle with lights to get all these images that I wanted, you know, and strobes that's and why all you this That's why you got Yen, Steve. He's no, but I was we, I was a photographer long before <laughs> I knew Jens, and it's like, and I was doing my still work, and it was all strobe work, multi strobes and stuff like that. You know, I you know what I do, but now it's like I got to take pictures on Thursday, and I'm using hard light and and probably an iPhone or something. They're gonna look great. They're gonna look like what I did in the '90s. But ah, you don't need lights. I know. <laughs> That's scary. That's kind of what people were saying about this 5D, which was scary at the yeah. time. Oh, you don't need to light anymore, which was not really the case. You just needed to use yeah. what was there and supplement, and you know. Anyway. Well, I'm gonna wrap it up by saying that really our whole friendship, the three of us, started a little bit before this 5D, but really we started making content together and everything beginning with you know the depth of field adapters and this whole what they're going to call the video revolution or i'm going to call it which is the evolution of going from film to video in the cinema space so it's been a great ride phil um you it's know it's not over it's not over yeah we're not we're not <laughs> dying it's I'm not gonna, over yeah, we'll back to film now <laughs> but but we've done a lot of fun things together and shows and all kinds of crazy stuff and um and we're going to be doing some new ones we've just talked about that so I want to thank you for being here, Phil. It was awesome to see you. Thanks, Phil. And um, Chicago one day. Yeah. Yes, soon, I hope. Let's Man turn it over to Mandy. Yeah. Mandy, you want to wrap us out? Sure will. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us on Memory Lane. A big thank you to ICANN, who provides all the lighting for the show, and our sponsors, Canon, Rode, Mikes, and Kessler. Um, there is also a, a coupon to celebrate, 20% off all orders, over 500 um, for our DSLR and mirrorless category. You can use the code DSLRBLOOM20, um, and we'll see you in a couple weeks with the next show. Thanks, everyone.